Ephesians 3, very, very weighty chapter. And, and like, uh, like the man of the kingdom, Paul's writings, they, they're on a upward incline. <laughs> Or if you look at another, they're getting deeper, deeper, deeper. Or for another way, they're getting wider and wider, taking more in. Yes. Oh, a couple of days ago, you wrote in your daily devotion that Jesus uh, said uh, to Peter, I must wash your feet. So we pray to ask. For Jesus to wash our feet from just because we're in this world. Yes. In this world, world's yes. Sayings. Well, in this case, we wash one another's feet. Remember, that's what Jesus told him to do. He says, "You see what I do? That's right. I wash one another's feet." Amen. So that yeah, that's involved in that. That's right. Amen. Now, Paul, he's he has this objective. He's very intent. On the Ephesians having a more thorough grasp of the nature of salvation. He wants them to see what they got mm -hmm. in Christ. See what they got. I would delight, I would be, find great delight in being wrong about this. But it seems to me like there's not many people that are concerned, have a profound concern on the people to whom they minister taking hold of the truth. It seems like this is a kind of an uncommon thing. I, I, I'm impressed at least with this. But this Paul, he wants people to know. Yeah. Why? Because you cannot live successfully for God in a state of ignorance. Amen. It, it can't be done. Yeah. When you are young in Christ and you're, you're at an ignorant state, God sort of protects you. He protects you during that growth time mm -hmm. so Satan can't touch you and you, he keeps people away from you. This God, he makes, he makes you stand, in other words. But there comes a time when for reason of time, a person ought to be strong and you know, all these safeguards are kind of <laughs> pulled back, <laughs> pulled back and, and you have to learn to stand on your own. You can't be having your Heavenly Father hold you by the hand every time you get up and lead you like a toddler. There comes a time you have to be able to stand. You're going to be in circumstances where there isn't going to be anybody but you and God and the enemy, and that's all that's going to be around. So you've got to be able to stand. So see, Paul, that's what he's targeting, that people will be able to do this. Now, it's exhibited in his teaching. He just didn't say this. I mean, there's people that say this kind of stuff. We want you, we want you, it's over. but they don't reflect that in their teaching. Yeah. Their teaching belies any professed interest in the welfare of the people and their spirits. Mm -hmm. They just don't teach so people will be better and closer and more informed of Christ. So I really don't listen to what they say about caring for people. I don't pay attention to them. Paul was in that way. You knew he cared by the way he taught. Uh -huh. yeah. He's already told him about some prayers he's had for them. Remember in the first chapter, he already told him about some prayers he had that had to do with broadening their spiritual perspective, the eyes of their understanding being opened up and so forth. Some verse read the eyes of the heart. The idea was they could perceive why. Why did God save me in the first place? Well, because he loved us so much. Well, as that's involved. There's a bigger objective than that. He had something intended, he intended to develop from that. And he prayed that their eyes might be opened up. Now he's, now he's going to tell them again some, something he prayed for them. This time it's going to advance a little, a little further. Before he said the Ephesian brethren were in his prayers. That's all he said. I remember you in my prayers. <laughs> but now, beginning with this text we're going to start with tonight, he, he goes a little bit deeper than that. He's going to tell them that he's going to pray for them particular that he would grant you. See, he's going to pray for them particular, very particular. I'm very interested in this. He is not sufficient. See, God works in an environment of light. 
even in creation, he didn't go set out to create till you, light was the first thing on the agenda. Illumination, that's the first thing on the agenda. Then he works in the environment of light. Now, it's the same in redemption. If God's going to work in the people, they have to be illuminated. That is, they have to see what God's doing. Now, you can go home and you can pray in your closet, Lord, tell me what you're doing, tell me what you're doing. But until you read in the Bible what he said he's doing, you just as well stop praying that. You first of all got to get into your mind what he said on this subject. Then you pray that he'll enlighten you. See, some people are praying for help when they're not in a condition to be helped yet. <laughs> they haven't availed themselves of what he's given them already. So now Paul's taught them already. He's told them already what God has done. Now he's going to advance that so that God can work in the lights. He's going to enlighten them as to what God's doing so God can do it in them. It's, it's one thing to think about God's doing this and God's doing that, but it's got to get down to it that he's doing it in you. And until that happens... It's like a so what. It's like a so what condition. And man's made up. God made man so the things not going on in him, his interest in it dwindles out. That's just how he made man's made up that way. He's interested in what's going on in him. He may not be interested in people being sick at all until he's sick. That's the way God made man, see? It may mean nothing at all to come into a big inheritance until you come into one. Yeah. Then it becomes of keen interest to you. Well, salvation is the same, same way. See, the, the postulate, postulate means the principle, foundational principle, is that God works in you to will and do of his own good pleasure but he does it while you are working out your salvation of fear and trembling. Amen. See, it's an environment of light. It can't be, God's work can't be done in the dark. So people don't understand what God's doing. Don't be telling them God's working it all out for you though. Don't worry, God's working it all out. God works all things together for good to them that love God. Them are called according to his purpose. Well, see those qualifiers. Those, those are qualifiers. Mm -hmm. Them that love him and are the called according to his purpose. So if a person doesn't love God and isn't called according to his purpose, God's not working everything together for their good. And if they don't know God does this for those that love him and are called according to his purpose, then they're going to anticipate. So with this teaching that we're being introduced to here, Paul is wetting the anticipation of the... I mean, if you want God to work in you, at some point you have to anticipate it and expect it and live in that expectation, hope for it, see? So that's what he's doing. He's creating this anticipation, this expectation, and what he's telling them is what God's told him. So this is not like a hope so, maybe this can happen sort of thing. God actually is doing what he's going to talk about, but what you want him, you want him to do it in you. You want it to be done in you. Technically, the only right that Abraham had to expect a child is that God said he was going to get it. That was the only thing he had going for him. <laughs> He could have sat around and wished for it for a long time. Probably maybe he had been sitting around wishing for it for 99 years. I say for 99 years. All right, here's our text. It's Ephesians 3.14 and the first part, uh, through the first part of 16. For this cause, uh, I say for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. i stop there because that's all we can handle tonight. I like the way Paul reasons. He, he, talk, he tells you something. He says, now for this cause, what cause? Or what he's been talking about? See, there's a certain...
kingdom logic in the way Paul teaches. He lays the foundation, he builds on it, then he builds something else on that, and he builds something else on that. This is how he teaches, which is the proper way. For this cause. Some other versions read, for this reason. Uh, and, and what is the reason? That's what we want to know. Why, why, what's the cause? Well, it's cause is stated, stated in the preceding verses. That this, is God's, this is why God's working in salvation to the intent or for this purpose that now under principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right. That's the that's the cause that's moved in to pray. <laughs> I'm praying this because God's intention is to teach principalities and powers and heavenly places his manifold wisdom by the church. So because of that, I'm praying for the church. It wouldn't take me long to count how many people I know that understand that that I just said. Institutionalism does not think this way. It's just not, not the manner of thought at all. They think in God said you better do this, so we're praying you do. That's how they, and even that's kind of advanced. Isn't it? Even that's kind of advanced. This is different. The thing that moves Paul to pray wasn't the condition of the Ephesians. It was the purpose of God. That's what moved him to pray like he did. Once what God is doing is perceived through Christ in his role in redemption, the purpose for the church is, is transformed in your perspective. I mean, there's all kinds of people saying, now this is what it's all about. I've heard people say this so long I don't even want to hear this sentence anymore. This is what it's all about. I've heard people say, helping the poor, that's what it's all about. Having a soup kitchen, that's what it's all about. Cleaning the people's yards and helping them when they have rise to the hospital, that's what it's all about. That's not what it's all about. That may be embedded in there someplace. When you get involved with God, these, those things are kind of part of it, but that's not what it's all. What it's all about is God getting what he desired when he saved us. Amen. What is God getting out of this? Amen. <laughs> and with some people, he's not getting much. In fact, they'll even tell you that. They say, well, I'm not much. I'm I'm so unworthy. I'm, I've just been saved by grace. That's, that's it. And that's as far as they can think. All right, this prayer is dedicated to such people. The mission of the church is not seen as just activity in the world. Once you see what God is intending to do, why he sent Jesus, why Jesus had to die, why the sins of the world had to be taken away. Why the world had to be reconciled to God. Why Jesus had to raise from the dead. Why Jesus had to go back to heaven. Why Jesus had to be enthroned to the right hand of God. Why Jesus has to mediate the new covenant. Why Jesus has to intercede for the people. Why he has to reign. See, unless you know all that answers to that, then you just people just lose interest. Because why? Because man can't come up with a cause big enough to match those kind of requirements. That you ought to keep the commandments, or you ought to be good, you ought to be a good husband, you ought to be good children. See, if that's as far as you go, that, that kind of stuff doesn't require the kind of investment God's made. That's right. He's made a big investment in this. There's been people die so we could know about this. Not to mention what Jesus went through. So he says, for this cause will I bow my knees. I bow my knees. Now see, people, 
They weren't afraid to talk like this. Most praise services has the people stand up. I see if you noticed that. Mm -hmm. huh? Paul's kind had him kneel down. I can tell you right now, the praise service would be really short if people had to kneel down. Oh, it wouldn't be long. And some of the words they said wouldn't, why he's in that position wouldn't make much sense. I bow my knees. Some verses read, I, I go down on my knees. That's, he, I didn't, he didn't mean I collapsed on my knees. <laughs> you know, I went down on my own of my own incentive when I went down on my knees. It's, this is a posture of submission. Now in the land of the free, there isn't much known about submission. Yeah. I'm thankful I live in this country. I'm thankful for the benefits we have and so forth. But if you don't watch out, it'll rob you of a lot of things you've got to know. Submission is like a downer in our society. It's an upper in the kingdom. Submission. Pharaoh made all Egypt bow on its knee, bow the knee to, to Joseph. See, Eastern countries, they know about this. They still do this. You, go to, you see a bunch of Muslim praying? They're not standing. They're down on their knee, the face toward the ground. And you'll find that posture quite a bit in Scripture. Quite a bit. In fact, Jesus, God has determined that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Now, that's, not just, that's just not hypothetical language. It's going to happen. Every knee, and then it says every knee shall bow. In submission and in recognition. See, you bow to someone who's superior. When you see the superior, you humble down before them. It's still required when you meet the king and queen of England, you have to bow. Even though some dignitaries from America don't know this, so they stand there like a bunch of idiots before. Oh, yes, this happened. They didn't know about this. But the rest of the world knows about this. China knows about this. Japan knows about this. India knows about this. They know about this requirement to kneel down and submit to someone who's superior. So in humble submission to the Lord and desirous of seeing his will fulfilled in the people, Paul assumes a bending of the knee position before the Lord. And he does it having boldness. See, you, this doesn't seem to match. Bending the knee and having boldness don't seem to match together, but they do. You bow the knee before the Father, and in that posture you can have boldness and access with confidence. Why? Because you're acknowledging, by your physical posture, you're acknowledging his superiority. I bow the knee to the Father. To the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he's very particular in this statement. Very precise. You'll never read such things as the Edomites worship the same God as we do. And no, no Israelite said that. No Israelite said down in Egypt they worship the same God as we do, just under a different name. That's not how they, that's not how they talked. That's not how we should talk either. Amen. Since there had been such an interest in Muslim, which there was none at all until they attacked our country, then all of a sudden people were interested. Yes. Right down the road here, they had on their make marquee, they were holding classes on studying the Quran so we could understand the Muslims. Because they came from Abraham, we all worship the same God. In fact, I had seasoned ministers call and write me and say, is it true that we worship the same God as the Muslims? We're not now. We're talking about seventy-five and eighty-year-old ministers asking that question. Said no, we don't worship the same God. 
They say it was the God of Abraham. No, it was the God of Abraham and Isaac. That's right. Amen. Yes, Muslims say and Ishmael. Uh -huh. yes. right. Ishmael is the promised son. And it goes further than that, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they sure, they sure don't acknowledge that. But that's the God yeah, amen. that he prays to. Yeah. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This expression is found several times in Scripture. I listed here for you. Jesus himself referred to God as my Father 47 times. In other, in other words... There is no such thing as a proper thought about God that doesn't include Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Right. Not making a difference who it is. Amen. I believe in God, the great God of the universe. Unless a person associates consciously and perceptibly the Lord Jesus Christ with God, he's talking about another God. Amen. Amen. Not the God that we're talking about. I pray to the Father. That means he beget Jesus. That means that Jesus didn't have a father on earth. He said, my father, which art in heaven. Amen. Yes, Brother Gene. The son did say, he who does not honor the son does not no, no, honor the that's father. Right. That's right. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. So they're connected. That's right. But if you have an ear... And you listen to what people are saying. They do not always represent God in this way. Mm -hmm. Professed Christians I'm talking about. Yeah. They do not make a point. Mm -hmm. See, Paul makes a point of this. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So you cannot think of God in separation from Jesus. And you can't think of Jesus in separation from God. Amen. They've got to be thought of together. Uh -huh. God the Father and Jesus Christ are inextricably, that means it can't be dissolved, linked together. It's not possible to come to God apart from Jesus, and it's not possible to receive from God apart from Jesus. So if a person's not alive with Christ, and Christ is not living in him, he doesn't even have access to God. They can't even come to God. Let's be straightforward about this now. He can't even come to God. No man. Comes to the Father but by me. Now this would interrupt some of modern theology, but it deserves to be interrupted. Remove God from the thought process, and there is not even a reason for Jesus. There's no reason for him apart from God. He's God's son. God sent him. God raised him. God exalted him. He's interceding to God. So you take God out of the picture and Jesus. Well, can't you see, brethren, that that's what's happened yeah. in the professed yeah. church? Yeah. Why is it that the church talks so little about Jesus? Yeah. Why is that? Because they don't see this connection of God right. and Christ. When Jesus was among men, the scripture says he trusted in God. He prayed to God several times in the Gospels. That is the God, that's the God before whom Paul bent the knee. To that God. I bow my knees unto the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a good practice. Anyone that desires to Pray on bended knee, just do it. It's difficult for me, but in the privacy of my chambers, I do this. I used to like to lay prone, but I can't anymore lay prone. Sometimes I ask, Lord, help me to lay prone before you, at least for a short season. I feel better. I feel better when I'm before God if I'm humbled down physically, in my physical posture. Okay, I, I, for this cause, <laughs> I bow my knees unto the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Other verses read, from whom, and some say for whom. 
Now, the theologians have disagreed on the identity of whom. Some choose to say it's the fathers what is, is the whom, of whom. Others say, no, it's Jesus is the whom. Jesus did it. Well, when you realize that he's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's not possible for one of them to, only to be involved in this. So of whom is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, as both of them together are involved in this? Because what the Father is doing, he has turned over to the Son. See? That's, that's, how, that's how it's taught. It, what God is doing, he's turned over to Jesus. And what Jesus is doing, God is said to be doing. And what God is doing, Jesus is said to be doing. So, of whom refers to the Father and Christ working in concert with one another. Then he mentions this, the whole family. <laughs> now, as usual, the various virgins, they have trouble with this. The whole family. I don't know already what you people think about when you hear those words. But everybody doesn't hear it that way. Some versions read every family. That's, that's different than all the family now. It's a New American Standard Bible. Every family. The Dewey version reads all paternity. The New Jerusalem Bible says every fatherhood. <laughs> Well, I wish sometimes these people would have found another job. They had the wrong, had the wrong job when they were translating the Bible. The percentage, the biggest percentage of the versions read every family. That's the biggest. So if, if the majority gets the vote, every family be the right, but it's wrong. Doesn't mean every family. That's not it at all. That contradicts the doctrine that's being developed by the apostle. That's what I want to take a moment here on. Paul's announced the purpose of God is to gather into one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. That's his aim. All things in heaven, all things are gathered together in one. Now, in developing this thought, he does not view mankind as a conglomeration of various families or tribes or nationalities or this sort of thing. He breaks them down to two. If you want to think about families, there's two human families from God's viewpoint. One's the Jews, one's the Gentiles, and in Christ, God brings them together. Amen. So you tell me, what does the whole family mean? All the different yeah. tribes and ethnic groups and nationalities, is that what it means? God doesn't even recognize these. There's, he takes the Jews and everybody else as Gentiles. And he makes them one. Yeah, right. And that one, that's the family. Amen. He's talking about. In the scriptures, the two groups are called Jews and Gentiles, or circumcision and uncircumcision. Only two. He doesn't speak about the Arabians, the Edomites, the Egyptians, the Syrians, he doesn't talk like this. When it comes to redemption, he narrows it down as two bodies of people, and God's purpose is bring them together, then he's going to join them with everything in heaven. So the family, that's the ones joined together in Christ. Paul's already affirmed he broke down the middle wall of partition between the only two groups. He broke down the middle wall of partition between them, made peace, and made one new man from them. Now they're one body. So for Paul to affirm that God has especially named all the families of the earth is an absurdity unworthy of, of utterance. He has not brought the Edomites or the descendants of Ham into one great family. He tells you who he's brought now. He's brought the Jews and the Gentiles in Christ into one great family. That's a marvelous uh, thing to just consider. He brought people, every member of the category of people called Gentiles were aliens 
from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise. That was all the people but the Jews. So the subject now in the consideration pertains only to those in Christ Jesus. That's the only ones that have been made one, one family. Nobody else has been made one, yeah, that's right. one family before God. One family. Now it includes those who are in heaven, mm -hmm. the whole family in heaven, mm -hmm. and on earth. So it includes souls in heaven. Those would be the spirits of just men made perfect. They're in heaven. Or those who, quote, died in faith. They're in heaven. Or those who are absent from the body and present with the Lord. They're, they're in heaven. So that's the heaven part of it. John saw souls under the altar. They're part of the ones in heaven. See, see how number, the number's already increasing quite a bit. They're part of the family in heaven. The great cloud of witnesses there. They're in heaven, see. They're beholding the race set before us. And all their knees are bowing to the to Jesus. <laughs> they all bow to Jesus. Now some particulars about this whole family. I provided the book of Hebrews. It informs those in Christ of the greatness of the society into which they've come. They've come to Mount Zion, under the city of the living God, the living, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. That's, that's how big this family is. <laughs> it includes angels. Some people say, well, Christian's the name. Well, who ever heard of a Christian angel? Uh, you ever heard of that? Uh, or a Christian cherubim? Uh, Why that's... No, the name Christian isn't the name. If it is, it sure is it's only used three times in all the Bible, and then it's from the enemy's viewpoint. Uh, yeah. So this means in some sense, this whole family is gathered together in some sense. It, in the fullest sense, they'll be made gathered together in the conclusion. But in some sense, they're together now. All right, brethren, it's my persuasion that when they meet together, angels are here. God is here. Jesus is here. Cloud of witnesses is here. Spirits of just men made perfect are here. Those that lived and died in faith are here. Those that are abs in the body, present with the Lord, they're here. In some sense, right. it's not perceptibly. I mean, it's not something you can say, oh, there's Gabriel over there. It's not, it's not that kind of thing. Right. Now, if you believe this, which I do, this alters how you conduct yourself. <laughs> this changes how you look, yeah. uh -huh. Yeah. how you act, uh -huh. how you pay attention. Huh? It just changes all of it. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I was, I was uh, preaching at, at a local chapel with some students. And I asked them, how would you how would you preach if you looked down and from you were up here now where I am and you looked down and there right in the front seat was Gabriel and Michael sitting there looking right at you. How would you preach any different? Well yes. Well they are there. Yeah. Amen. And there's more than them there. I can imagine Abram, Abraham, looking over at Sarah and saying, did you notice that those people down there don't even know what we knew? Hmm? You think that doesn't happen? Some of these, St. David, I long to have what they are supposed to possess, and have you noticed that they don't even know what they got? It makes a big difference. God's making this one. So it be, the gathering has to start here. It's culminated there. But it starts here. You notice that after the appearance of an angel, after people in Christ got over the appearance of an angel, 
they had no trouble listening and remembering what he said and things. They had no trouble. Why? Because they were one. That's right. Part of the same family. When they were joined, and, and then after the ones that I've mentioned, that assembly is joined by God the judge and Jesus the mediator and the blood of the new covenant. Yeah. <laughs> it speaks better things than that of Abel. They join in this yeah. assembly. So God's here and Jesus is here. The blood of the covenant is here. You're, it's accessible to you mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. All right, the whole family. That's the whole family. We describe the whole family. That's the whole family. <coughs> I bow my knee now to the, God, to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom, well, he's the one that did this, the whole family mm -hmm. is named. Now the fullness of this name hasn't been revealed yet. In fact, we actually know very little about it. I think you can kind of it harmonizes with something Jesus said in Revelation 3.12. As the name of my God, he was going to put on the people, the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon my new name. That's a lot of names. Maybe it's all the same name. Is there something to think about? <laughs> In general, it's going to be the name is going to depict the character and attributes of the people. This is how God names people according to their character. Yeah. Abram is changed to Abraham, father of many nations. Mm -hmm. Sarai is changed to Sarah, mother of many nations. See? Cephas is changed to Peter. Simon is changed to Peter or Cephas or rock. All through Scripture, God did this. He would name people according to their character. Barnabas is called son of consolation. See, he was, they were renamed. Now, when I was uh, brought up, people were, or some people at least, were more deliberate in giving names to their children. They'd name them with more deliberate some weren't named very deliberately. My, my mother's middle name was Willie. <laughs> I said, where did you get the name like Willie? She said, well, there's some hobo was walking down the road shortly after I was born, and he came in and suggested that might be my name. Now, knowing her background, I could believe it. I never was sure that that actually is what happened. But what I'm saying is that people, they don't, don't take care in the naming of the children. But they did in scriptural days because this reflects, reflects God's nature. Like Adam means man, what it means. He named Eve Eve because she's the mother of all living. See, the names meant something. So there's a name. You're going to name them. God said it would be something like uh, when God said he's going to name Israel. Isaiah 62, 4. Thou shalt be called Hephzibah meaning my delight is in her. And thy land Beulah, which means married, for the Lord delighted in thee, and thy name shall be married. So the, the idea is they changed their nature of Israel, so he gave them a new name. Now when the whole family is assembled, everybody's there, he's going to assign a name that is appropriate for this body of people. It's going to be a different kind of name. There's probably never been a name like this. As I said, some are the persuasion that Christian is a name, and they use a convoluted interpretation of Acts 11, 26, the disciples are first called Christians at Antioch, and say that word called there means divinely called, so God's the one that called them that. But here's the catch. No, no apostle, no one ever addressed a believer as Christians. Ever wrote an epistle to the Christians at Philippi. This was never used. No, that's not the name. That's what men call them. Nothing wrong with the name. It means of Christ or pertaining to Christ. So you see with what godly expertise Paul is stretching the minds of the elect. <laughs> you get them to think, no, oh, just think of yourself. Think of the whole yes, amen. family. Amen. Think of the whole family. In heaven. Yeah. See, he's 
stretching the capacity. So when you think, when you think about the people of God, you think of this in this larger, oh, we're talking about including Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're talking about the holy angels. See, it stretches your mind. Why? Because your mind has to be enlarged to even think about what God's doing. You have to have a larger frame of reference and your peripheral vision has to be wider and it has to be keener. You have to be able to focus on something better. Your mind's involved. So Paul is using great kingdom expertise in enlarging the thinking. You also notice something that's happening here. As Paul teaches, the people are thinking less and less about themselves. <laughs> you know, yeah. Notice how you get, you get caught up in what he's saying, and you're, you're all of a sudden you're not thinking about yourself. You're, mm -hmm. you're thinking bigger than this. Yeah. All right, now, Paul, you, you told us that you're bowing the knee to the God and Father, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who, who's... Who's going to, who has given a name to the whole, we're going to give a name to the whole family in heaven and earth. What, uh, what, what are you asking that God to do? Well, I'm asking that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Now, he's speaking about salvation. He's not speaking about some high exalted state that only a few enjoy. He's speaking about the salvation that involves God giving us all things in heavenly places, about the God that chose us, the God that predestined us, the God that redeemed us, the God that, all the things he said about God, that's the God he's talking about, and the salvation, he seed us in heavenly place in Christ Jesus, made us accepted in the beloved and all these things, that's the, that's the process he's talking about, salvation. God chose us from the foundation of the world, predestined us to the adoption of sons. This relates to him making us accepted in the beloved, to redemption and forgiveness, to him abounding toward us in all wisdom and prudence. It has to do with what he's purposed in Christ, the obtaining of an inheritance, being sealed with the Holy Spirit. See? All of this applies to that that he's been talking about. He hasn't started a new subject here. All of that other was the introduction. Now he's getting into the main, main theme here now. This has to do with us being saved by grace through faith. It has to do with the middle wall of partition being broken down, why that was so. It has to do with him coming and preaching peace. It has to do with the church being built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. He's always on the same subject. All these are foundational thoughts and he's building on them now that is to say he couldn't say this if the other wasn't true he, he couldn't talk about he couldn't address God and ask God for something this big if all these foundations that he'd mentioned before in chapters 1 and 2 hadn't been laid Amen. That's right. or even if they had been laid and he didn't see them yeah. uh -huh. he couldn't pray like this right. this prayer is uttered in the awareness of all these things that he's unveiled to us haven't you found it impacts the way you pray when you when you see these things? Amen. I prayed that. That's the objective. This is where I'm. This is where I'm headed now. That he would grant. Yes. Other versions say that he would give you. Lexically, or the definition of the word according to the. Greek language is to give, to give something to someone of one's own accord, to give one something to, to his advantage. Okay, so giving for, for an advantage. To bestow a gift, to give one asking, person wants it. To supply, furnish necessary things, it's all that's involved in grant so God in strict accord with his purpose now that he stated he's going to give things in strict accord with this aim to gather together all in one in Christ he's in strict accord with the nature of salvation he's going to give them something something that pertains to salvation see 
Salvation is so big that what he's going to talk about has got to be included. Amen. Save people at some point have to get what Paul is praying for. Amen. Yeah, that's right. Now, maybe for years they didn't. Maybe they never heard about it, whatever. But at some point, mm -hmm. they have to hear about it, mm -hmm. and they have to come into possession of it. You might grant. Mm -hmm. I, I like that word. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in the uh, world of grants, if you ask for a grant from somebody, they have to, you have to present your case. You have to be worthy of yeah. receiving the grant, whether it's money or whatever. The person who's granted has to have it mm -hmm. and has to want to give it. Yeah. That's the same with God. Mm -hmm. What God grants, he has. What God grants, he wants to give. What God grants, the people need. Now, he's going to grant it. There's going to be some boundaries here. Mm -hmm. According to the riches of his glory... It'd be like saying, God, a man's going to give you a grant out of his riches, but it, the, what he gives can't exceed what he's got. <laughs> if he's got a billion, he can't grant two billion. According to the riches of his glory, here's how this reads in various versions, the riches of his glory, glorious riches, wealth of his glory, treasures of his glory, abundance of his glory, Glorious unlimited resources, wonderful and glorious, with his great glory and the rich treasury of his glory. Now, what is his glory? What is his glory? According to the riches of his glory. All right, what is his glory? What is that? Is he is not, it's not that easy to define, is it? But glory is what is seen of a thing. That's his glory. If nothing can be seen of the person, he's got no glory. So the scriptures speak about the sun has a glory, the moon has a glory. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 41. The moon has glory up in appearance. It appears a certain way. And it's different stars. They have their own individual glory. They appear different ways. So the glory of a person is what can be seen. Now, Jesus referred to Solomon's glory. What was Solomon's glory? It's what you saw. Yeah. Yeah. Him arrayed in and his court says. Since it has something to do with what's seen, it also has something to do with light, doesn't it? With what? With light. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So the glory of a person is what can be seen of him, which is in the light. That's what light, light tells you what the person is, yeah. When the son says glorify, yeah, he's he's talking about uh, making himself known, That's making exactly make me known, and then, That's and, exactly and then it. he's glorifying the Father as well, making mm -hmm. him known. So That's we, right. You say this is the Lord, mm -hmm. yeah. and then you point out how he can be seen in that whatever it was. Yes. Manifestation of glory. When we speak of God, of course we're. We speak of glory because he is altogether beautiful. Yeah. And there is no darkness in him. So any manifestation of God is a glory. Amen. But uh, the glory of a thing is that which is virtuous and praiseworthy yeah. that's been made known. Because it speaks yes, of those amen. who glory in their shame. In other words, they make manifest things yeah. that are shameful and yeah. they're, they're too ignorant and benighted to realize that it's something that should be repented of and concealed rather than you know set out there for everyone to see. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now what now follows will will not be experienced independently of the knowledge of God. We are told in Scripture that when we are initially converted, it's the glory of God that did it. Commanded the light to shine into our hearts, and that we were we were recreated by His glory. And it's an ongoing. We behold His glory. We grow. Second Corinthians three eighteen. So 
So this prayer will be answered as God is made more perceptible or put it away as we understand him more. It's that understanding that contains the supplies that's required. That's the God and Father, now the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the glory of God is reflected in the face of Jesus Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 4, 6. And as that glory is reflected and you see it, it has transforming Amen. power. Yeah. Amen. That's to be converted. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then in 2 Corinthians 3, 18 says, We beholding his glory uh -huh. are changed. See, so, so the resources, oh, this is ingenious, the resources that you need are hidden in your perception of God. Amen. If your perception is small, that however many resources fit in that little smallness, that's, that's what's available that's to you. Right. You can't have more mm -hmm. than you can see. Amen. So that he, that he's given us everything we need for life and yeah. godliness. True. The that's, that's what he's talking about, you mm -hmm. see. So I'm praying he would grant you according to his. It's not, this is like not like magic or something God imposes on people. God is going to grant you his riches as you see what he has revealed. All that can be seen of God is what he's revealed. We all understand, understand that. But he's revealed his fullness in Christ. So all of this is in Christ. You get as much as you can see, whether you're just newly come in or you've been in here for 60 years. You get what you can see. And Paul, when he says, according to the riches of his glory, he's asking God the same thing he did in the first chapter, to open the eyes of their understanding, to see what you've revealed. I'm preaching it, Father. I'm, I'm preaching what you've revealed. You've revealed what you're doing in salvation. You've revealed what the end objective is going to be. Now to get to that objective you have to have these resources. Amen. To be included in that grand gathering you have to have these resources of his glory. Amen. But to have them you have to see you have to see them or perceive them or comprehend them or understand them. So that, brother, what are you praying for? That'd be a grant. So you say, a person might say, and quite truthfully say, it's very difficult for me to understand these things. All right? We understand that because we, we were in that condition ourselves. But here, here's the good news. God is able to give you a grant. Amen. <laughs> God could give you a grant. So you can see these things, because once you see them, you'll want them. Amen. And once you want them, yeah. you'll get them. That's, right. That's how the kingdom works. Amen. Amen. Apply for the grant. Amen. Amen. And if you can't see, when we pray for people, yeah. think of it as asking for a grant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. huh? That's what we're doing. Yeah. And you can do that for somebody else. That's right. You can ask God to open up someone else's eyes. Yeah. You can do that. That's what he's doing. That's, right. That's what Paul's doing. Yeah. You can do it too to your major. So you can ask that they will see at least what you see. Mm -hmm. That's where you got to start. Mm -hmm. See what you see. And you already have the proof that what you see can be seen because you see it. Yeah. So that ought to drive you to ask God to give that to, yeah. give that to brother, sister, so and so. Let them see it too. Because I know you can do it because you did it for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, Brother Bob. Yeah. Yeah, when Paul was there, he was on the road, and he he was blinded, and he said, "I'm going to send you to make all men see." <laughs> he didn't give him like a magic wand, <laughs> and he went around just tapping mm -hmm. people on the head, and they saw everything. He went about preaching Christ. That's Remember, right. immediately oh, he started yeah. preaching Christ. Amen. He started opening up things that were prophesied that, about the Messiah. He yeah. opened them up. Why? Because he, he, he knew saw, how right. to make men see. That's right. He saw them himself. Yeah. And so in this prayer, he but he knows that he he's not gonna he's not doing it. 
And yes, even sir. though he's doing it. Yes, so he sir. bows his knee. He's going to get God involved in this thing. Who can give the grant? Yes, sir. Yeah. Even though God has already given him the commission That's to right. do this. So, so in carrying out what God told him to do, he asked God to jo join in the work. <laughs> That's how the kingdom works. Amen. Aren't you glad you're able to see that? <laughs> it's like take a weight. Like take a weight off of you. Yeah. The weight of the kingdom. I labored sometime with the weight of the kingdom on me. If you don't do it, it won't be done. So forth. No. If you don't do it, another will. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's how the kingdom reaches. Amen. Even uh, Mordecai knew that. He said, yeah. "He says you come to the kingdom for such a time as this. But if you don't do it, God will raise up someone else. Because yeah. uh -huh. this is the time. This is the time. God's doing something. He sensed it. Well, it's the same in our time. This God's doing something in this day, Amen. Yeah. and He can do it through you." Yeah. And we were going, we pray that he'll grant you, give you a grant. So you'll be able to see it and do it. <laughs> you, how could I, the other disciples go everywhere we're preaching the word and they were persecuted if it wasn't they saw something? They could never have done that. Yeah. All right, anyone else have a word tonight? Brother Rick? That there's a difference between giving out of your riches and giving according yes. to your riches. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If a millionaire gives according to his riches and he gives 10 bucks, he's not giving according to his riches. Yes. Yeah. That's nothing. <laughs> if he gives yeah. right. $300,000, now that would be according to his riches yeah. because he's given much more than any That's of right. us who are not millionaires can That's give. Right. So yeah. If God has a great deal of resources to give, then that means we need a great deal, a great deal of resources. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Otherwise, he wouldn't make them known. Now we've been given to see the riches of His glory and salvation because it's so large. Yeah. And and uh, I was and I was thinking about when you were saying that. Now Paul was able to bow his knee, mm -hmm. and he can. And you said you know you can bow your knee, you can pray, you can do it with, you can humble yourself and yeah. still do it with boldness and confidence. Yeah. And so it occurred to me that Paul was able to do this because he had this understanding yeah. mm -hmm. of salvation and, and all the things. Amen. And so, you know, with that understanding, how, how, what a difference has it made in my own prayer life that I've come to understand yeah. so much of God's salvation, how big it is in His mm -hmm. eternal purpose. It just changes everything about how you approach Amen. God. Mm -hmm. Now look at Paul's approach. He was to testify to Jews, Gentiles, and kings. So he didn't like sign up for a course on witnessing or read a book on evangelism. He sought for a grant. <laughs> yeah, see the difference? He had a pretty big commission, brethren. And there are commissions compared to his or rather it's minuscule, really. And yet people go about these smaller missions trying to seek to fulfill them with the wisdom of men instead of by the glory of God. Oh, yeah. All right. Anyone else? All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for a great salvation and for abundant access and for provisions that are adequate to get us from the battlefield to the presence of God. We thank you for the salvation's greatness and pray that you should give us grace to live in a manner that glorifies you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.